Hello, welcome and thank you for joining WEFS TV at Eastern Florida State College for our annual Constitution Day observance. My name is Christopher Muro, Associate Political Science Professor and your host for today's program. September 17, 2023 will mark the 236th anniversary of the signing of the United States Constitution making it the world's longest surviving governing charter. As an institution of higher learning, Eastern Florida State College has a duty and a responsibility to enhance the discussion, the debate, the appreciation, and the awareness of our Constitution, its structure, and our guiding constitutional principles. Uh, to that end, we are uh, delighted to have with us a very uh, distinguished uh, guest uh, who will be joining us uh, to help us realize these objectives, and that is Dr. Sanford Levinson. Sanford Levinson holds the W. St. John Garwood and W. St. John Garwood Jr. Centennial Chair in Law at the University of Texas at Austin, where he became a faculty member in 1980. Dr. Levinson holds a PhD from Harvard, a Juris Doctor from Stanford University School of Law. Dr. Levinson is a visiting professor at Boston University, Georgetown, NYU, and Yale. Dr. Levinson has written more than 450 articles, book reviews, and commentaries about the Constitution, and is the author of seven books. It is an honor, a privilege, and a pleasure. Dr. Levinson, welcome, and thank you for giving us the time, sir. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, now, just based upon the title of some of your books, uh, for example, 2006, our undemocratic constitution, where the constitution goes wrong, and how we the people can correct it. Uh, 2018, Democracy and, and Dysfunction. Uh, your 2012 book, Framed uh, America's 51 Constitutions and the Crises of Governance. And of course, the 2017 uh, book, uh, Fault Lines in the Constitution, The Framers, Their Fights, and the Flaws That Affect Us Today. Obviously, based upon the title of your books, uh, the premise here is, is that their Constitution has some issues, it has some challenges. Uh, what would be an example, uh, Dr. Levinson, of, uh, in your view of a flaw that's in our Constitution today? The U.S. Senate. Um, there, James Madison in Federalist 62 described equal voting power in the Senate as an evil. He said it was a lesser evil. The greater evil would have been for the convention to collapse and for the United States basically to dissolve into two or three separate countries along the Eastern seaboard. But an evil, it remained like slavery for that matter. I mean, there were two principal compromises in 1787. The compromise over the Senate because it became just the way we think about the American system of government usually is called the Great Compromise, capital G, capital C. Nobody refers to the various compromises over slavery as great compromises because we all realize that they were compromises with a rotten ideal. But as with the Senate, they were necessary in order to get the union. I mean, one of the things that I constantly try to impress on students, and in fact, I'll be teaching a so-called reading course at the Harvard Law School this fall for the second time, on the topic of compromise. And one of the central themes is that all politics involves compromise. We can't be purists, but we ought not blind ourselves to the fact that sometimes the compromises 
are really quite dreadful. And they make sense at the time because the alternative would be the collapse of the whole constitutional project. But that doesn't mean that 225 years later, we should continue to think they're desirable features of the American political system. Nobody today would say, well, because the framers were willing to compromise with slavery, so should we. And the point of a lot of what I have written, or the last book you mentioned, I wrote with my wife, because the notional target of the book is teenagers. And in fact, it's, it's assigned in some community colleges, um, is to talk not about the framers per se. I never engage in founder bashing. It seems to me important to understand that they were doing the best they could in the context of 1787. The people I want to bash, quite frankly, are ourselves because we're not willing to think so critically and audaciously as they were in 1787. Well, your premise then would say that, for example, that uh, Florida with 23 million uh, residents, uh, uh, Wyoming uh, with uh, perhaps 600,000, uh, they should not both be equal in the Senate. But uh, is, it, is it plausible to think that there would be, the states would be willing to give up uh, that kind of power uh, and representation in the Senate? No, oh, it's a terrific question because the answer is no, that people with power, especially if the power is hard to justify, quite frankly, are going to be very reluctant to give it up. And one of the worst features of the 1787 Constitution is the entrenchment in Article 5, the amendment article, that says basically that the Senate is unamendable unless every state agrees to it. So that the example you give, which is a terrific example, why should a state with 23 million people, or I live in Texas, a state with 28 million people have the same two votes in the Senate as Wyoming with about 555,000 people or Vermont with about 650,000 people and the point of the first book that you mentioned, that is our undemocratic constitution, points out that most people today, that is in the 21st century, think that the essence of democracy is one person, one vote. The US Senate spectacularly violates that principle. And the only reason for the Senate is the recognition in 1787 that unless the delegates capitulated to the demands of Delaware and the other small states, then the whole necessary project of constitutional reform would collapse. That might be a good reason to do what they did in 1787, just as frankly, one can swallow hard and justify the compromises made with slavery if you believe that it was really vitally necessary to get a new United States government up and running. But an argument that justifies what people did in 1787 does not obviously work to say that we should applaud the results in 2023. Now, Dr. Levinson, uh, we've been able to uh, ask our political science students here at Eastern Florida State College. Uh, they've submitted questions and comments. So throughout our discussion today, I'd like to bring up some of those questions and comments. And our first one today is from a student uh, on our Melbourne campus, an American national government student named Connor who submitted this, and I think this is timely here. Uh, his comment is, um, he would like to see the Constitution change where 
the Senate would be required to vote on a presidential a nomination within 60 days and also uh, concomitantly eliminating the recess appointment power. Uh, what do you think of that as a proposal? Requiring a Senate to, to give advice and consent and also removing the recess appointment power? I think that both are very interesting. I probably would agree with Connor on the 60-day rule. The recess appointment I probably would also agree with him. I mean, recess appointment is an excellent example of something that made sense in 1787 because Congress met relatively infrequently. And so if there was, if the Secretary of State died, for example, it would really be useful if the president could name a new Secretary of State before Congress came back in, let's say, seven months. But today, as a matter of fact, Congress is pretty much in kind of universal session. So it's not clear that we need the recess appointment power. The main point I would make with regard to this question is that, as you may know, I actively support the idea of a new constitutional convention because I think we're long, long overdue for a serious national discussion about what works and what doesn't. So if Connor were a delegate and proposed both of these, I think they would be excellent topics for discussion. And then at the end of the discussion, we vote up and down as to whether the proposals should be in the Constitution or not. But they're really the sorts of things we ought to be talking about. Yes. Um, I I've, I've, I've know that in previous uh, articles I've read of yours, you've, uh, you've talked about separation of powers and you've talked about uh, checks and balances uh, but you've done so in, in a way that is not uh, extolling these, con these principles, uh, but you seem to think that they are an impediment of some sort. What, what is wrong with the checks and balances, the separation of powers uh, you know, that we have come to, um, to extol? Uh, what, what's the problem there, Dr. Levinson? Well, I think that especially checks and balances, separation of powers is tricky I mean, as you know, the phrase is nowhere in the U.S. Constitution, and Richard Neustadt, you know, eminent political scientist in the mid-20th century, coined the term separated institutions sharing powers rather than kind of hermetically sealed institutions. But checks and balances is really the more, more important part of your question, I think that I think all of us, and this would be, I think, the central topic of the Constitutional Convention that I wish for. How risk averse are you? If you are really scared that government legislatures would run away and pass bad legislation, then you want to put a variety of checks and balances to prevent the possibility of passing bad legislation. You will like bicameralism. You will like a presidential veto. You will like strong judicial review because you're really terrified of bad legislation. If, on the other hand, you believe that especially in the 21st century, we really do need government that can respond to the challenges of the day. Whether you're on the left, right, or center, you might be interested especially in climate, which in Florida would make a lot of sense. You might be interested in how do we finance medical care. You would certainly be interested in the immigration issue, 
There are lots of other things we could talk about, but I think that one of the things that unites the right and the left today is a feeling that Congress just is not really confronting the central problems because there are so many checks and balances, we call it gridlock. So it's not that I think that there isn't a threat of bad legislation, but I also think that the greater threat these days, and one of the things that explains why so many Americans believe the country is headed in the wrong direction, and a huge majority of Americans, regardless of their place in the political spectrum, has no great regard for Congress, is because when they look at Congress, they see a dysfunctional institution. But the dysfunctionality is in part just another name for checks and balances. So well, you know, the bottom me, line, yeah, yeah sorry. Bottom I wanna line. say, well, as, as a, an example of this, uh, I think we saw when President Biden uh, issued a vaccine mandate on September the 9th of uh, 2021. Uh, and then we saw there was a, a lot of consternation over that. And then with the uh, intervention of, you know, the Supreme Court in its ruling declaring that uh, the president didn't have that authority. I mean, isn't that kind of a shining example uh, that people would look to as checks and balances working? Uh, to protect the balance of power in our system and to protect the rights of the citizenry? You know, I think the answer to your question really depends where you are on the political spectrum, because I think that there are some people on the right who would agree with you completely. This was the system working, you had an overreaching president, and thank goodness we had a Supreme Court to intervene and say that um, OSHA didn't have the delegated power. If you're not on the right, I think you would say that Congress had, in fact, delegated the power to OSHA, and the delegation was completely constitutional, and what you had was a conservative Supreme Court intervening and checking, certainly checking and balancing, but the whole point, it's a, it's a great illustration because for every person who applauded the Supreme Court intervention, there was at least one person who saw that as just another example of the checks and balances run riot, that you know there is always the possibility if you push the right lever that you can block things from happening. And that's what checks and balances is ultimately about, stopping things from taking place. Well, I, I, think, I think that you made a great point. Uh, unfortunately, you know, there's some of us that uh, are concerned about process uh, but most of us are only concerned about results. If we get the right result, then the system works. If we don't get the right result, then it's the system's fault. Uh, personally, I'm more of a process uh, uh, individual that's focused more on process. I, I did want to get another question in. I know our time is, uh, is uh, running uh, by very quickly, Dr. Levinson. Uh, Natasha is a uh, American National Government student at our Eastern Florida online campus. She submits this question and comment um, saying the Constitution has been around for over two centuries. It's produced the greatest nation in the world. Uh, we have 50 state constitutions that are much more easily changeable. Shouldn't there be one constitution that's static and that the 50 state constitutions are easily changed? I, I think that's a good point. Isn't that really the answer? The state constitutions yeah, can be changed? <laughs> That's a terrific question for lots of reasons. First of all, I really commend Natasha and Natasha's teachers for making her aware that there are in fact 50 state constitutions. Because I think that one of the pathologies, and I use that word advisedly, particularly of law schools that I'm most familiar with, 
is that too many Americans believe there's only one constitution in the United States, and they don't realize that every state has its own constitution. The other point that Natasha makes, which is extremely important, is that every state constitution is more democratic, little d democratic, than the national constitution. The third thing I would say is that it's not true that the United States Constitution has survived splendidly for 225 years and has you know, necessarily made us the great country that we are. We killed 750,000 people between 1861 and 1865 because of the defects in the 1787 Constitution. Generally speaking, we don't want to talk about that. We want to say that there's you know, this consistent history. Um, most state constitutions are relatively easily amendable. And in fact, many states have replaced their constitutions to bring them up to date. Each of the 50 states has had just short of three constitutions. Massachusetts is still operating under the 1780 Constitution, but it's been amended well over 100 times. Uh, Montana got its most recent Constitution in 1972. From my perspective, this speaks well for state constitutions because what that indicates is that there is an awareness that we need to bring institutions up to date. Florida has a constitutional revision commission. Um, Florida also has the opportunity, I think, for initiative and referenda. And I have, you know, I'm in very interested in Florida and know that Florida Floridians pass amendments or the, the constitutional revision commission will suggest amendments some of which is an outsider I applaud, others I'm not such a big fan of, but what this means is that Floridians like Natasha are not only aware that Florida has its own constitution, but have a sense of empowerment. So from my perspective, what is really unfortunate about the US constitution is that we don't encourage the same kind of critical edge with regard to the national constitution that we do with our state constitutions. What we do is to celebrate the US constitution where I would disagree with Natasha. She says the constitution has made us the great country we are. Well, as a political scientist, I would say, well, yes, in some respects, but in other respects, it's really been damaging. Like, for example, taking the Civil War and the death of 750,000 people into account, or the fact that American states were allowed to operate a system of Jim Crow for at least 100 years after the war, so that the 13th Amendment that abolished slavery turned out to have much more limited impact than a lot of people thought it would. All of this has to be taken into account. Now, Dr. Levinson, in our remaining few moments, uh, I did want to touch on, I know in 2011 you, had a, you were hosting a conference about federalism and its future. Uh, and here we are 12 years later, we've seen uh, Dobbs' uh, decision overturning Roe versus Wade. Uh, of course, vaccine mandates were upheld by, for states. States were able to do that. Uh, what is your, is this what you saw federalism uh, 12 years ago as being in the state? Uh, would you agree that it's, uh, we've kind of seen a renaissance in, in federalism? Um, yeah, yeah. I think, frankly, one of the consequences of the Trump presidency was that a lot of liberals rather suddenly <laughs> saw some virtues to state autonomy that had been pretty much absent from 
the way most political liberals thought. Um, so I think that federalism has its attractions at different times to both liberals and conservatives because it does provide a way by which states can resist a national government they're unhappy with. But then the question is, do you applaud the resistance or not? That ultimately is a political question. And But I would also come back to what you said, that you're very much interested in process, as I am. And so, again, you know, it is worth discussing as I do when I teach. So what do we think the process should be with regard to the ability of states simply to refuse to comply with national laws? You know, nullification right. was a huge controversy in the 19th century. Florida, like Texas, ultimately seceded from the Union or tried to secede. What do we think of that? as kind of the ultimate trump card in a game of checking and balancing. Well, I, I do think we've seen uh, this uh, uh, kind of a rebirth uh, uh, and a re, uh, kind of a renaissance in, in federalism. The trick there, of course, is that uh, a person in Florida or Texas, you know, has to be able to uh, allow uh, people in New Mexico and Oregon to, uh, to pursue their, their policy interests as well. And I think that's the big, uh, the key to making federalism work. Um, Dr. Levinson, unfortunately, our time is coming to an end. Uh, it, it always goes by very quickly whenever, uh, <clears throat> whenever you're with us in, in the studio or in our classrooms. And we really appreciate you giving us the time. I want to thank WEFS TV, uh, the production staff and, and uh, team here at the college. I want to thank our students for submitting questions. I want to thank our viewers for tuning in. And Dr. Levinson, I want to thank you for joining us and for giving us the time here today. And I hope that we can continue this discussion and hopefully we can meet again in the future. Yeah, this has been my complete pleasure and I'd love to do it again. Thank you so much, Dr. Levinson. My name again is Christopher Muro and for Eastern Florida State College, thank you for joining us. Good night. <laughs>